beneath this grassy hill lies over four and a half million cubic feet of radioactive waste, enough to fill 64 Olympic swimming pools. Water has caused problems at another NECO site in Maxi Flats, Kentucky. When I tell people that I work at the Maxi Flats disposal site, the first reaction is always a gasp and a, and a strange look. Though today it's nearly indistinguishable from any of the other fields atop the flat ridges of the Knobs region, the signs around its fenced perimeter indicate its past as the nation's first commercial disposal facility for low-level radioactive waste, which began operation in 1963. So when it opened up, we got waste from all across the country, but it primarily came from the Department of Energy, uh, universities that did research, and hospitals. The Commonwealth of Kentucky thought that this could be a money-making venture. There was no uh, nuclear repository for waste at the time, and there were stockpiles. So people needed somewhere to put all of this waste, and the Commonwealth says, well, hey, let's do that and, and we can make money off of it. They thought they had a nuclear disposal facility. It being the first one in the country, it would attract other types of industrial or nuclear industry, like power plants, research facilities. However, the only piece of the nuclear industry the site brought to Kentucky was its waste, often in water-permeable cardboard boxes and wood crates, which were buried in 52 trenches spread across 30 acres. Before there was regulation from the EPA, before there were OSHA regulations, before we have current landfill standards. We didn't do things the same way then that we do them now. So all of the disposal that was carried out in the beginning of the site's history was shallow land burial. There was no bottom liner. Um, there was no leachate collection system. There was no kind of barrier from those materials that were dumped to direct communication with the environment. So it did. It did directly communicate with the environment and it migrated outside of the waste cell. Uh, anytime you're near a radioactive source and you want to assess a, a risk factor, you have to know what your exposure rate is so you can uh, protect yourself from it with time, distance, or shielding. Burying radioactive waste underground is one way of introducing this separation. The earth above the waste creates both distance and shielding as the waste naturally becomes less radioactive over time. Solid radioactive waste handled in this way can be sequestered without significantly affecting the surrounding environment. However, the waste disposed of at Maxi Flats was not properly contained, and in 1972, monitoring conducted by the Kentucky Department of Health indicated migration of the radioactive material tritium. Prior to the cap, we had an issue with water getting into the trenches, raising the water level within those trenches, and of course, that mixes with the waste and eventually the water flows out and spreads to groundwater. As concerns mounted, a citizen's watchdog group formed by local leaders and community members began calling for the closure of the site. In 1977, the Commonwealth directed the nuclear engineering company to discontinue the acceptance and burial of radioactive waste. Two years later, the company's license to receive low-level waste was revoked, and the site's care was handed over to the Commonwealth. At the close of the 1970s, there was widespread attention on the need to address contaminated sites. In response, Congress enacted the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, which created the Superfund program. Not only did the program seek to identify, investigate, and clean up hazardous waste sites across the country, it sought to have the restoration funded directly by the responsible parties. So if you create a waste, or you have a waste disposed of, you're responsible for it after it's disposed even. In 1983, the Commonwealth initiated the process for the Maxi Flats disposal site to be included on the national priorities list, and three years later it was admitted into the Superfund program. In 1991, the EPA signed its record of decision, the site's cleanup plan. That natural stabilization process just leaves everything where it's at because it's more dangerous to move it than it is to leave it where it's at. And you, you cover it up as well as you can to keep the rain from getting to it and pushing it where it's not supposed to be even more. 
The cleanup was to be done in three stages, an initial remedial phase, an interim maintenance period, and a final closure period. During the IRP, over 80 sump pumps were sunk into the waste trenches to remove contaminated water. One method to dispose of the leachate mixed the contaminated water with cement, forming concrete that was built into an underground bunker. Another method of disposal used an evaporator, which released clean water vapor into the air while the remaining contaminated solids were separated and stored in tanks at the site. During the IRP, we removed a million gallons of water from it. And prior to that, when the evaporator was running, I think it was 13 million gallons of water that was removed from the trenches. At the end of the IRP, the site was covered with soil and capped with a 60-acre synthetic liner. Basically, a plastic cover was over it, a black plastic cover. The IMP followed, and trained staff with the Energy and Environment Cabinet took frequent samples of water running off the site. The samples showed the levels of tritium went down, indicating that the cap was successfully keeping rainwater from reaching the waste in the trenches. However, this initial cap was brittle, requiring workers at the site to frequently weld new panels over breaks in the liner. When it got cold, it would almost shatter like glass. The original cap was then replaced with a new polypropylene liner. It was much, much, much more resilient to the climate change and the sorts of things that you see from ultraviolet exposure from the sun beating down on it every day, all day long. In late 2012, the EPA determined the site was now ready for all remaining waste to be buried and the final earthen cap and permanent surface water control features to be installed. In its current state, the cap appears just to be a grass mound. And in reality, it's much more than that. The cap is a composite structure made of layers of specially engineered materials. It's actually like a sandwich. There are lots of layers and there are lots of different purposes for those different layers. The existing polypropylene liner was used as the base layer. Above that, a geogrid, a structural material used to reinforce and stabilize soil, was laid over the trench areas. That stuff is crazy. One square foot will hold an SUV. And this is covering acres. Over the geogrid is a layer of fill dirt covering the whole 55 acres, all gathered from borrow areas within the buffer zone of Maxi Flats. The dirt forms a mound, contoured to direct runoff to the appropriate water control features. We have in some areas, we probably have 30 feet of leveling field. Covering that is another layer of the geogrid, this time spread over the entire cap to provide additional stability. Above that is a geosynthetic clay liner, which is a man-made composite designed to expand and seal when exposed to moisture. And it simulates a foot of clay and its protective properties, but it's actually only a few millimeters thick. Atop that is another layer of plastic, a polyethylene geomembrane, on which rests the geocomposite drain. And this is a tight weave net that allows the rainfall that comes through and percolates through the soils to run off and go where it's supposed to. At the very top is what's visible at the site now, a layer of soil and grass. By keeping the burial trenches dry and contained, the waste is able to stabilize, safely separated from contact with humans, animals, and the surrounding watershed's forests and farms. Scientists with the Commonwealth's Energy and Environment Cabinet, like Scott and Tom, will continue their sampling and maintenance of the site for the next 100 years. The radioactive levels here are that of what natural background are. And as long as we continue to maintain the site to the standards that we do, and we continue to monitor, because you never know when something new might develop, as long as we continue to monitor, we have the public protected.